Washington State University. Go Cougs! Now, sometimes in the literature, there's not those measures out there. And then you're in that position of having to create a measure and show that you're using a good measure. And there are some ways for being able to do that. The other thing that you want to be able to do is show that your data can generalize. So when you're done your study, you want to say that my data can generalize pretty well across people and across environments. Now, a lot of our aging research that we do here at the university and more generally, do you have any ideas of the, the type of people who might come in to do aging research projects, especially in cognition? So I'm, I'm going to test you and look at your cognitive functioning. Any ideas who kind of ends up in our samples? What about education? You think we have a good spread of education? You think there might be? Yep. So we see people who are more educated. Um, what about race? Yep, yeah, especially in this area, we see predominantly white. Um, and let's see, um, a lot of times just because of age, we have a, a larger percentage of female participants, but we also tend to see a lot of middle class participants. So a lot of our aging research, this is widely, has been on white middle class well-educated um, older adults. Now there has been, you know, a big push uh, to change this because it really ex affects the external validity. So what is true for white, middle-aged, well-educated adults may not be what is true for lower income or other ethnic groups or people who are not as highly educated. And so one of the things that when you're submitting a grant proposal, you typically have to show that you are going to get a diverse group of participants. Now, one of the things that was recently added, and there's a big push, and this has been helpful to us in this region, is that um, rural communities are now a diversity. So working with individuals who live in rural areas now can fit that diversity um, requirement because there's a need to capture more information um, about that group. We just talked about the importance of reliability and validity, right? Um, so that's something that we're going to have to pay attention to. We're not going to be able to test all of that, but we can try and create or use the literature to say, you know, this is a good sort of Likert scale to use, like a 1 to 5 or 1 to 7, or maybe we want to use the percentage of 0 to 100 percent. So you have to use what's out there in the literature to t try to design the best kind of method you can for the research that you're doing. All right, so any thought, any other thoughts on that information? Okay. So let's talk a little bit about research design in terms of non-developmental and developmental research. So in non-developmental research, we're looking at examining relationships between factors that may apply regardless of age. So, for example, um, a question about, you know, I don't know, engaging in brain health behaviors. Do, are those who, who engage in more healthy behaviors, are they more active or do they do better on cognitive tests? Okay, that would be a non-developmental question. Irregardless of age, we're kind of interested in that relationship. But we could change it into something that's more developmental and say those people who are engaging in brain health behaviors now, 15 years later, are they going to have better cognition? Okay, so there we're interested in how the aging process actually affects our data. And that's part of um, kind of the developmental research design, trying to get at the age effects. So we want to know, are the differences due to some sort of underlying aging process? It could be, you know, the biological changes, the psychological changes, the social changes, but really, can we say that the process of aging itself is affecting our outcomes? 
Now there are two ways that we can typically look at age-related questions. We can use cross-sectional and we can use longitudinal designs. And each of these have their own confounds. So cross-sectional designs, one of the things that, that's really great about those is you can do them very quick, well, quickly, as long as you can get your participants. But what, what you would do is, let's say we have a survey, and we would give it to a group of people that are age 20 to 35, 35 to 50, 51 to 65, 70 to 85, and we would do that now, today, and we just find people of all those different ages. So that's what we call cross-sectional. Most of our aging research is done this way because it's easier to do than the other type of design, which is longitudinal. So longitudinal is where we take people and we follow those same people over time, right? And so in 2005, we tested these people in the primary school. Now we're gonna test them when they're in secondary school and then young adults and middle-aged adults. We have some people right now that we've been following longitudinally for five years who have been living in smart apartments. So you can see how this research, one, takes a long time to do, right? So if I were interested in middle-aged adults now and I want to see whether or not if I can teach them how to be healthier, that um, decreases their chance of Alzheimer's later on, I would have to follow those individuals for a very long time to be able to get that data. Now, some of the things that can happen when you're doing that is you can have changes in personnel. And if you're using certain measures, that may cause changes in your measures. So they might not be as reliable because maybe the two administrators are doing something a little bit differently. There can be a lot of subject attrition. So you have missing data that you need to account for. You can also have practice effects in your data. One thing that um, we've had in one of our studies a lot of times to mitigate practice effects, what people will do is they will create two versions of the same test. And those versions of the same test are supposed to be identical, but they're not always identical. And sometimes like having those two versions, I think can be um, worse than actually looking at the practice effects and trying to control out um, the practice effects if they're not equivalent. So one of the things that longitudinal designs allow us to do is talk about age changes, changes that are actually occurring as part of the aging process. But there is a big confound that needs to be disentangled in these types of studies, and that can be measurement effects because of time. So if, um, I don't know, maybe if I'm looking at um, some sort of political viewpoint, right, um, maybe how people, what people think about terrorism. And then in the middle of me looking at that longitudinally, some huge, you know, terrorist attack happens that changes, you know, a lot of people's views about how they're viewing those things. Then it could be that it's not so much the age effect, but it could be what happened during that time that changed a lot of people's views. So the other thing with um, cross-sectional research, when we're testing people all at the same time, but of different ages, that can be a big confound for our studies is cohort effects. So let's say I did a survey, um, I don't know, asking about people's preferences in music. And I found out that um, as people get older, they tend to like Frank Sinatra more. Okay, so did I really find an age effect? Did I find something that was related to age? Is it true that as people age, they tend to like Frank Sinatra more? No. Probably what I found is a cohort effect, right? People living at different times have different preferences. And so that can affect the data. So when we're doing cross-sectional designs, we really can't say that the effects are due to age changes, but what we're really looking at is differences because of age. And let me show you how this can really affect the data. This is a study um, that was 
done looking at a verbal meaning test. So they basically gave people a word and said, you know, tell me which words were um, highly related or it has the same meaning as this word. They looked at the data both cross-sectionally, which is in the squares, and longitudinally, which is in the circles. Now, if you take the cross-sectional data and you look at verbal meaning, what does it seem to be telling you? What happens as you get older with your verbal meaning abilities? They get a lot worse, right? Okay, you see this big decline. But if we look at the longitudinal data, so these are the same people being followed over time, we basically see no decline in verbal abilities. So basically, this is an example of cohort effects. So maybe the questions or the, the, um, the words maybe weren't even around when these people you know, were, were younger, so they may not have an idea of what those words were. Or it can also work in the opposite direction. We have um, a test called the Boston Naming Test that looks at word finding problems. And um, some of the pictures are things like a yoke. So um, how many of you, if I showed you a picture of a cow with kind of a yoke on it, would know that it was a yoke? Like, okay, so a few of you. Um, let's see, what was another one? An abacus. How many know what an abacus is? Okay, a couple of you. But, you know, these are things that older adults would be very familiar with, right? But our younger generation may not have the familiarity with. So these are things that are important to take into account when you're trying to look at differences between um, different age groups. Um, this is an example of a very complex design that can be used to help pull apart some of those different cohort and time of measurement effects where you would start with two different cohorts of age, ages, six and eight year olds, say in 2002, you would retest them in 2004 when they're eight and 10, and now you can start pulling apart some of these different cohort and time of measurements by looking at different aspects of the data. Of course, again, they're, um, they're very time intensive and costly.